Henley did not write this poem until after he had discovered the door to that secret passageway which I have mentioned. You are the master of your fate and the captain of your soul by reason of the fact that you control your own thoughts, and with the aid of your thoughts, you may create whatever you desire. First acquire patience and perseverance, then make up your mind what else you want, and you will be almost sure to get it. As we approach the close of this lesson, let us pull aside the curtain that hangs over the gateway called Death, and take a look into the great beyond. Behold a world peopled with beings who function without the aid of physical bodies. Look closely, and whether for weal or for woe, observe that you look at a world peopled with beings of your own creation, which correspond exactly to the nature of your own thoughts as you expressed them before death. There they are, the children of your own heart and mind, patterned after the image of your own thoughts. Those which were born of your hatred and envy and jealousy and selfishness and injustice toward your fellow men will not make very desirable neighbors, but you must live with them just the same, for they are your children and you cannot turn them out. You will be unfortunate indeed if you find there no children which were born of love and justice and truth and kindness toward others. In the light of this allegorical suggestion, the subject of accurate thought takes on a new and a much more important aspect doesn't it? If there is a possibility that every thought you release during this life will step out in the form of a living being to greet you after death, then you need no further reason for guarding all your thoughts more carefully than you would guard the food that you feed your physical body. I refer to this suggestion as allegorical for a reason that you will understand only after you shall have passed through the door of that secret passageway to knowledge that I have heretofore mentioned. To ask me how I know these things, before you pass through that door, would be as useless as it would be for a man who has never seen with his physical eyes to ask me what the color red looks like. I am not urging you to accept this viewpoint. I am not even arguing its soundness. I am merely fulfilling my duty and discharging my responsibility by giving you the suggestion. You must carry it out to a point at which you can accept or reject it in your own way and of your own volition. The term accurate thought, as used in this lesson, refers to thought which is of your own creation, thought that comes to you from others, through either suggestion or direct statement, is not accurate thought within the meaning and purpose of this lesson, although it may be thought that is based upon facts. I have now carried you to the apex of the pyramid of this lesson on accurate thought. I can take you no further. However, you have not gone the entire distance. You have but started. From here on, you must be your own guide. But if you have not wholly missed the great truth upon which the lesson is founded, you will not have difficulty in finding your own way. Let me caution you, however, not to become discouraged if the fundamental truth of this lesson does not dawn upon you at first reading. It may require weeks or even months of meditation for you to comprehend fully this truth, but it is worth working for. The principles laid down in the beginning of this lesson you can easily understand and accept, because they are of the most elementary nature. However, as you begin to follow the chain of thought along toward the close of the lesson, you perhaps found yourself being carried into waters too deep for you to fathom. Perhaps I can throw one final ray of light on the subject by reminding you that the sound of every voice, and of every note of music, and of every other nature that is being released at the time you are reading these lines, is floating through the ether right where you are. To hear these sounds, you need but the aid of a modern radio outfit. Without this equipment, as a supplement to your own sense of hearing, you are powerless to hear these sounds. Had this same statement been made twenty years ago, you would have believed the one who made it to be insane or a fool. But you now accept the statement without question, because you know it is true. Thought is a much higher and more perfectly organized form of energy than is mere sound. Therefore, it is not beyond the bounds of reason to suppose that every thought now being released and every thought that has ever been released is also in the ether or somewhere else and may be interpreted by those who have the equipment with which to do it. And what sort of equipment is necessary, you ask? That will be answered when you shall have passed through the door that leads to the secret passageway to knowledge. It cannot be answered before. The passageway can be reached only through the medium of your own thoughts. 
This is one reason why all the great philosophers of the past admonished man to know himself. Know thyself is and has been the cry of the ages. The life of Christ was one uninterrupted promise of hope and possibility based entirely upon the knowledge which all may discover who search within their own beings. One of the unanswerable mysteries of God's work is the fact that this great discovery is always self-discovery. The truth for which man is eternally searching is wrapped up in his own being. Therefore, it is fruitless to search far afield in the wilderness of life or in the hearts of other men to find it. To do so brings you no nearer that which you are seeking, but takes you further away from it. And it may be, who knows but you, that even now, as you finish this lesson, you are nearer the door that leads to the secret passageway to knowledge than you have ever been before. With your mastery of this lesson will come a fuller understanding of the principle referred to in the introductory lesson as the mastermind. Surely you now understand the reason for friendly cooperative alliance between two or more people. This alliance steps up the minds of those who participate in it and permits them to contact their thought power with infinite intelligence. With this statement, the entire introductory lesson should have a new meaning for you. This lesson has familiarized you with the main reason why you should make use of the law of the mastermind by showing you the height to which this law may be made to carry all who understand and use it. By this time, you should understand why a few men have risen to great heights of power and fortune, while others all around them remained in poverty and want. If you do not now understand the cause for this, you will by the time you master the remaining lessons of this course. Do not become discouraged if complete understanding of these principles does not follow your first reading of this lesson. This is the one lesson of the entire course which cannot be fully assimilated by the beginner through one reading. It will give up its rich treasures of knowledge only through thought, reflection, and meditation. For this reason, you are instructed to read this lesson at least four times at intervals of one week apart. You are also instructed to read again the introductory lesson, that you may more accurately and definitely understand the law of the mastermind and the relationship between this law and the subjects covered by this lesson on accurate thought. The mastermind is the principle through which you may become an accurate thinker. Is not this statement both plain and significant?